If evolution is adaptation informed by hereditary memory, and if adaptation is a purposeful phenomenon driven by mind and intentionality, then it's not a far leap to conclude that evolution is also a purpose-driven and mind-driven phenomenon. This is where we depart decisively from the Darwinian idea. Darwin's own motivation was to explain the origin of species in a manner that was mechanistic and law-driven. I don't want to diminish the motivation. Even so, he wasn't entirely successful. Darwin's own classical Darwinism ran into trouble in the late 19th century, and the supposed rescue of Darwinism in the early 20th century just doubled down on the error. And the root problem was this. Life is not just mechanism. The essential attributes of life include purposefulness, intentionality, and intelligence. And no theory about anything involving life, including its history, evolution, can exclude those attributes. Yet that's precisely what the Darwinian idea seeks to do. Purposefulness, intentionality, intelligence all derive from life being fundamentally a cognitive phenomenon. Even the simplest creature, like this paramecium, is a cognitive being. It takes in information about its environment and uses this information to modify its own function or its surroundings in response. That's cognition, distilled down to its basic features. All life is cognitive, and there's even a name for this, universal cognition. We can derive a theory of intentionality through a general conceptualization of cognition, one that can apply to all life, universally. I want to emphasize that I'm staying well away from consciousness here. Consciousness is a different idea from cognition. Consciousness is idiosyncratic for one thing, I know I'm a conscious being. I'm pretty sure about you. I think it might be likely that my dog is a conscious being in his own way. And even, say, a crab might have consciousness. But at even one step removed from me, the conscious experience of other creatures is not something that's accessible to me. Consciousness is completely idiosyncratic in a word and mixing it up with cognition just muddies the water. Okay, with that proviso, let's lay out a theory of cognition, starting, appropriately enough, with this famous diagram from René Descartes. Any cognitive system creates a representation of the outside world. The representation could be as elemental as a change of function in a, inside a cell when the environment changes. You might say, that's just chemistry, and you'd be right about that, but it's still a kind of mental representation of the real world, a reshaping of function in response to a sensory polling of the environment. Even simple creatures do this, and you don't need a complex brain to create some kind of mental representation of the outside world. Let's generalize this. We have an environment with properties represented by a symbol, with a particular shape and color. There's an interface. We can think of this as an adaptive boundary that takes in information from the outside world and feeds it into a cognitive system, which creates the mental representation of the outside or real world. Closely related to cognition is something that we can call tracking. If there's some change in the outside world, a cognitive system will modify the mental image of the real world to correspond to the changes. That makes sense. If a cognitive system is to be of any use at all, the mental representation should change along with changes in the real world. In short, a cognitive system should bring the mental world into conformity with what the senses are saying about the real world. Okay, that's pretty straightforward, but conceptualizing cognition in this way reveals two other dimensions to cognition that might not be so obvious.
cognitive systems never exist on their own in a medium of pure mentality, if you will. Cognitive systems are always coupled to some kind of a living engine that can do work on the real world, on the environment. That's the nature of life, of the extended organism, in short. And we can call this a motor system. Out of this coupling comes intentionality as a fundamental feature of cognitive systems and is applicable to all living beings, no matter how simple. If, for example, there's some disagreement, some disconformity between the mental representation of the real world and the real world itself, instead of tracking the real world, the motor system can get to work on the environment to bring the real world into conformity with the mental world. The opposite of tracking, essentially. Now, it's the mental world that creates the real world in its image. And it's a short hop from there to creativity. If, for example, some mental image arises within the cognitive system that has no correspondence with the real world, the motor system can get to work modifying the real world, again, to bring it into conformity with the mental image of the world. And this time, the result is to create something that previously had only existed as a mental representation. That's creativity. Out of the simple conceptualization of cognition, we get two attributes of living systems, intentionality and creativity, that most biologists, and nearly all evolutionary biologists, would exclude a priori from our thinking. Why? Well, because nearly all evolutionary biologists are atomists. Even so, this model of cognition, intentionality, and creativity is still looking pretty mechanical. We're not yet at a theory of purposefulness, but we're getting there. Here's a paramecium swimming through its environment. Let's pause this and take a look at what's happening here. The paramecium is a thermodynamic system. It's a pool of orderly matter. Furthermore, it's a pool of very specified orderly matter, specified in this case to be a paramecium. To build a paramecium, work has to be done on disorderly matter to impose the specified orderliness on it. As the work is done, this energy degrades to heat, and the orderly matter degrades again to disorderly matter. This is a continuous process, and if it stops, the paramecium is dead. All this is managed by the adaptive boundary of the paramecium's cell membrane, which uses sensed information to modify the environment within and outside the cell, enabling the paramecium extended organism to persist through time. This is all still pretty mechanical, all cogs and levers and clockworks. There's no purposefulness to be found there yet. Rather, purposefulness is to be found in the paramecium striving to be a paramecium. That paramecium has to somehow know to be a paramecium. It has to have some self-knowledge of what to become and to persist. The BS was Aristotle's idea for the source of this self-knowledge. We don't really believe in the BIOS anymore for the simple reason that the BIOS can't evolve. But the BIOS does capture the essence of adaptability, which the Darwinian idea cannot explain adequately. What we are left with is hereditary memory as the source of the self-knowledge. But memory is only memory if it's a process. And the only way hereditary memory can inform adaptation is through the adaptive boundary working to sustain the paramecium's specified orderliness. This, in a word, is homeostasis. Not the clockwork homeostasis, but homeostasis as one aspect of life's fundamental nature. As the paramecium moves about, the environment may change, the adaptive boundary will modify its working, but the one constant in all this is the paramecium itself. And this is purposefulness, to continually strive to be a paramecium, to want to be a paramecium.
Let me restate now my operational definition of evolution as adaptation informed by memory. Adaptation is inescapably purpose-driven. Logically, this must mean that evolution, the history of life, is also an inescapably purposeful phenomenon. Let's follow a paramecium over time from past into the future. This blurry line represents the environment the paramecium is experiencing at the time, so it tracks the paramecium through time. Okay, let's fix the paramecium in time here. The paramecium might stand still on the page, but time is still marching on, so now it's the timeline that moves. We're just riding along through time with the paramecium. The paramecium is a thermodynamic engine. Matter is continually circulating through the paramecium, as is energy, ensuring that the paramecium persists through time. And this is all managed by an adaptive boundary, which takes in information and mediates the cycling rate of matter and energy as circumstances change. Intentionality comes in when the paramecium reshapes its surroundings to sustain the flows of matter and energy from the environment. And this is the forward-looking aspect of the paramecium's memory. If the reshaping is long-lasting enough, this memory trails along in the paramecium's wake as it moves through time. And that's the backward-looking aspect of memory. Okay, let's see how this works for lineages. Let's fix the timeline in place, and we start with a paramecium here. An individual paramecium has a life cycle which includes death and reproduction. Through time, generations of paramecia come and go. Okay, let's reset again. We're using a cartoon of an individual paramecium to actually represent a population of many individuals, within which there'll be variation, which I'll represent with paramecia with slightly bluer color. This generation of paramecium exists in an environment which itself will vary. How will things proceed moving forward in time? Each paramecium contains within it a complement of hard inheritance represented by this green hexagon. As the paramecium restructures its environment, this modifies the epigenome represented by this purple circle. The modified environment also forms a memory that extends forward in time, and how far forward depends upon how persistent the modification is. If it's sufficiently persistent, this forward memory will persist when the present generation of paramecium dies, and the subsequent generation now lives in this restructured environment inherited from its predecessor. This includes the variance within the population. The individuals in this generation will restructure their environments as well. And as we move forward in time, the environment will change, as it always does. Let's suppose that the variant we've represented with the bluish paramecium latches onto some of this variation to start restructuring part of its environment in its own way. The greenish variety will continue to adaptively restructure an environment in its own way, passing this on to its descendants. The bluish individuals in the population, meanwhile, will pass on a different structured environment to their descendants. And so it will go, generation upon generation of paramecium. As generation succeeds generation, the variation in adaptive modification of the environment will modify the epigenome further until eventually new forms of both epigenomic soft inheritance and of hard inheritance will arise. We see here that what's driving the evolution of these lineages is not really variation in the object memory of hard inheritance, as the Darwinian idea asserts. Rather, it's the adaptation coupled to the resulting process memory that is driving these lineages forward in time. The lineages are being pulled forward through the intention-laden phenomenon of adaptation. As time proceeds, the epigenomic soft inheritance feeds back and modifies the memory tokens, the hard inheritance carried in the genome. So we've now turned the Darwinian idea on its head. The genes, 
The supposed carriers of hard inheritance are actually being dragged along in the wake of ongoing adaptation by subsequent generations, in the wake of the purposeful striving of living creatures. I mentioned earlier in this series that for many years I was a pretty staunch Darwinist, and that now, several decades later, I no longer am. This course is my scientific case for abandoning the Darwinian idea. I can no longer hold it up as a credible theory of evolution. Also, earlier in this course, I mentioned that how we think about evolution has profound societal and cultural implications as well. Now that you've heard my scientific case, I'd like to touch briefly on those societal and cultural issues. Ever since Darwinism first burst onto the scene in the 1850s, controversy has swirled around the cultural implications of his idea. Usually, this controversy has been built around a narrative of scientific rationality on one side and religious obscurantism on the other, enlightenment versus darkness, to put it bluntly. This is mostly hokum. The supposedly religious controversies in Darwin's time were due mostly to internal fighting within the Anglican Church. Darwinism was just the convenient club of one party to beat up the other. The actual science had nothing to do with it. This was not to say that Darwinism did not have its difficulties, but the most serious ones were mostly scientific in nature, as I've laid out. In the 20th century, this phony narrative of enlightenment versus superstition has persisted, mostly over how and even whether we should teach evolution to students, no matter whether they're in high school or even in universities. This is a real pity. A healthy society would be having rational public conversations about this topic. Yet, from the Scopes trial in 1925 to the present day, our public square has been dominated by two competing and quasi-religious narratives that are so far apart philosophically that there can be no accommodation between them. What I hope my particular take on evolution will do would be to open up what's presently a no-man's land in the middle of the public square. By taking this physiological approach to evolution, my hope was to revive a long-standing philosophical predisposition that actually bridges these entrenched philosophical traditions. I'm a scientist, and I'm quite happy to acknowledge the motivations and value the contributions of my colleagues on the atomistic side. We've learned an awful lot from their efforts, of course, and the beauty of science is that it's always undermining its own dogmas. But I'm also quite happy to acknowledge the assertion that there is a kind of intelligence at work guiding evolution and the organization of the living world, and I think that idea has a great deal to recommend it. I don't agree with the essentially platonic motivation between, behind intelligent design theory, for example, and that makes me a critic, but I'm a friendly critic. I think they have a point, and we should be talking about it. Okay, that's my take on evolution. And all that remains is for me to thank you. If you've hung on this long, you've done me the honor of at least taking my argument seriously, and that's all anyone can reasonably expect in the realm of ideas. If you're interested in knowing more, let me recommend my three books that I mentioned early on in the course. These books represent my intellectual journey away from the Darwinian idea. They're full of examples and discussions of many of the issues that I've run through pretty quickly here. I had fun writing them, and maybe you'll have fun reading them as well. I hope so. I've also put together an open-ended series on YouTube on evolution. There, I go into more depth 
on a lot of the philosophical and scientific issues we've covered in this course. The series is free and public, and you might enjoy watching them. My hope in producing this series, and this course for that matter, is to spark broader public discussions of evolution, and maybe you'll find them worth sharing with colleagues, friends, students in your lives, school boards, church groups. I'm always open for conversations with anyone about these ideas. Here's my email address. Drop me a line if you like. If you really want to dive into the weeds, visit my website, where I have links to many of my publications and other efforts to understand evolution. And once again, thank you. Thank you.